And now it's time for the latest exciting episode of Doz's Television Workshop. Hello, and welcome back to Dozzy's Television Workshop, where today it's part two of our Fidelity HF10 record player restoration. Here it is, minus its turntable, because we did that in last week's episode. If you haven't seen that, uh, go and find that. Um, lots of sticky grease to unstick, as is common with these things. Um, but today, we're going to take a look at the electronics, and we're going to need to make some modifications. But first... We need to get the thing out and give it a damn good servicing. Um, you will notice I have mounted a camera uh, down here so we can sort of see because the lid's in the way so you get nothing from that camera. And so, yeah, we've, uh, it's a bit difficult to look at. So I think the best thing to do is to extract the amplifier chassis as best I can. And um, yeah, hopefully we can uh, get it out and get it serviced. Uh, things to note, we got two valves, they're very new, ECL82s, um, Pinnacle branded, so uh, yeah, they were a little bit cheap and cheerful in their day, but that's a replacement part, they would have originally been uh, mullards in here, I think. Um, our speaker wiring has been slightly got out. Our mains wiring here, oh, I've got my hand in the way, come this side, you can see that there. Uh, live and neutral is red and black because it's, you know, 50s. But our green wire, which is our earth, has been cut off. Now, I'm not sure I like that idea. I worry if we've got a leaky mains transformer or something, but uh, we shall overcome. Right, so first things first, we need to get that chassis out. And I'm not really sure how to go about this. Uh, first thing's going to be to slacken off. I'll just move the camera down. You can sort of see a bit. This, oh, it's not really gripped in very well at all. This mains lead here, so we can extract that. Can I just skip it underneath? Oh, I can. Lovely. So that's that free. Now, we seem to have got four screws here, but this is a one piece, so I'm not quite sure whether the whole thing... Um, let me just move the camera so you can see what I'm on about. We've got two screws here and we've got two down there as well um, sort of screw it to the side these pieces of wood but the brass sort of discussion for the tone and volume controls is behind that so I wonder if it all comes out as one piece um, we've got some sort of wooden mounting blocks we've got two 4BA screws uh, rather bolts just up at the top here so I think that's my first port of call is to undo these and I'm hoping the whole thing will sort of slide out. That's uh, loose. Let's take that out by hand. There it is. Okay, pop that in my parts tin. And there's the next one. No washers or anything, they appear to be nylock or equivalent. Right, is it going to move? And the answer is a resounding no. So, well that's sort of come in there. So what's going on? Hmm. Does it just need a bit of brute force on these screws? No, something down the bottom there holding it in place, which I can't see. I'm going to use my mobile phone trick. No, I'm not because I haven't got it handy. <laughs> OK, one wonders. Have I got to take those screws out? It does appear that it's hinging on these screws, but how on earth do you get those out when that transformer at the bottom there these bottom ones, let me move that mains lead out of the way to make life a little bit easier. These screws at the bottom here are behind the transformer. Ah! There's another big nut in the middle. Is that 
something we can get out. Is that going to aid our course? I'm not going to take it out completely. I'm just going to slacken it. Oh, it's certainly helping. So I'll take that all the way out. I'll just look around the front, see if there's anything sort of by the speaker cloth that will uh, aid, but I don't think it will. Right, let's just unscrew that. Just in case I haven't mentioned it, this record player is actually stereophonic, um, which for 1958 was something a bit special, I think. I'm wondering whether this screw actually attaches a piece of tag strip or something. Well, it's out. Let's just... I've made no progress at all. Do I need to remove the knobs? I think I may well do. Oh! They're going to need a bit of persuasion. Right. I'm going to have to try and undo these screws, aren't I? Well, that's not going to be the easiest job in the world. Not in particularly straight, I must say. But then again, like everything else on this record player, I think things have been got out of it. Right, well, yeah, they don't go all the way through, so does that, no, you see, it's all coming away as one, as one piece with the brass plate you can't see. Let's move the camera again. This is very suboptimal. I do apologise. Hello. Uh, yes, so this is all coming away, look, as one piece with the wood. So I must be missing something somewhat fundamental here. And I can't, for the life of me, see what. Ah! Yes, it, it does all come out as one piece. Am I missing a bolt or something down at the bottom there? Perhaps up behind here? That's very tight at the bottom. But no, that's all coming out as one piece. Perhaps I just have to sort of limbo it over. Oh, let's move the camera again. So there's like a wooden plate, uh, let me point the screwdriver down here, that sort of holds the chassis in place. Do I have to just sort of manipulate it over that? Don't think I do. It's all sort of coming, isn't it? So I wonder if I pull it out at the top, it'll allow me to Easy to, ah, now I am stuck on the knob here, so, oh, that's not, that's not good, I've got it stuck now, go back in, go back in, go on, right, okay, let's try and ease this knob off, because it's catching on the escutcheon on the side of the, side of the radio, right, that's the volume knob removed, that's good, because we can get these cleaned up now, and, so the tone knob, ah, oh, come on, that's come, oh, Mmm. Tone is stubborn. And I can't see the back of the shank on the pot, otherwise I could tweak it from there. Oh, this is suboptimal. I don't want to break it. Please don't break. I've got nothing to lever against, really. Oh, yes. Right. Let's try that again. Ah. <laughs> Is there anything in behind there? No. Gosh! You see what? These were made to a price, weren't they? You can just tell. Ah! Oh! Oh, now we're talking. Ah! Now 
find some adhesive up behind here. See if I can sort of persuade that to part company. Where's the small screwdriver? Without scratching everything to ribbons. Okay. Right. Oh, hallelujah. There we have it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're going to have some work to do here. Right. Um, yeah, let's stop there. Take the chassis out and um, show you what I'm dealing with. So here's our chassis of electronics. These two brown leads and this one with the green and red on it. Those are our speaker outputs. I unscrewed the Bolgin one whilst you weren't looking, which went to the Bolgin plug at the back of this thing for the external speaker. I'm not sure whether it's right or left, to be honest. Um, and I've marked the colours there just to at least make a token gesture of getting the phase right. Um, we've got a reservoir capacitor, 32 by 32, so it's two caps in one can. Uh, 25 volts DC working. Oh, it's more than that. It's 32 plus 32 at 350 volts. And then it's 32 microfarads at 350 volts, followed by 25 microfarads at 25 volts. What a bizarre thing. Um, this is indeed a rectifier over here. Westerlite contact cooled rectifier. I'll do some googling on that and see what on earth it is. If it's a selenium it will go. Um, we need to see if it's, it looks like it might be a full wave bridge you know. But that's up in behind there. If that's a selenium rectifier which it does look, looks like it. AC comes in on these orange leads. DC goes out. Negatives couple back to this chassis so Certainly we can't earth that chassis there. This is our mains transformer here. A uh, little bit concerned about one piece of that wiring there. Somebody's attempted to sleeve it. But it's all sort of twisted together and not very nice. Dial lamp is in there. This is our tone control. Obviously double stack for stereo. Same with the volume control for mono. Um, yeah, two valves. ECL82 as mentioned previously. Now that's a triode pentode. So uh, it's a triode as a preamplifier and a pentode as the power amplifier. Um, the output from those stereo cartridges is a crystal cartridge um, and it has two properties. One is extremely high voltage output so it'll swing a volt or so and two it closely follows the RIAA curve just naturally as the way it's constructed. So um, I want to fit a different kind of cartridge and uh, we're going to need to put another preamp in here, which is going to give me some issues. May end up fitting another mains transformer. I've got a plan though, so it's all good. Um, yeah, so underneath these diminutive little fellas here, let's have a little zoom in, shall we? These two diminutive little fellas here are the output transformers. Uh, where are we? Banana for scale. Um, yeah, so that's the size of those. Um, we've got some very sticky, nasty wax coated capacitors. They will all be the best part of useless, I should imagine. There's another electrolytic strung on this side. I'm going to guess that's another 25 mic. I reckon that's going to be our other cathode bypass. It's not, it's 16 mic at 450. My goodness, they had some smoothing in this thing, didn't they? Right, so we've got our, some work to do here. So uh, there's some more horrible waxes over here. I think I'm going to start with these. You can see where the wax has been uh, coming away. And what happens is, uh, I believe they get hygroscopic and the wax sort of breaks down then they start electrically leaking 
They're generally making a mess of uh, your bias and everything else. Uh, the other thing we need to do is just to uh, check the values of these resistors. There's a couple of mustards in here, as they're called. Those will be rock solid, almost guaranteed. Just look at that. Oh, hello. Somebody has been in here before. Look, there's a bit of shielding on this transformer. A bit of sleeving. Yeah. Yeah, that transformer's had... That's where the HT, I think, feeds. Yeah, it is. That's the HT from the power supply feeding the primary of the transformer. The secondary, obviously, being the speakers. So you have your HT rail, then your transformer, and then off to, your, off to the anode of the valve. Right! Work to be done. There's a very scorched looking something or other there as well. Look at the state of that. This one has previously burned up. Yeah, this one is probably not far behind it. Okay, I think I'm going to have to reverse engineer part of this circuit. I wonder if that was 10 ohms. The trouble is we don't know. It's so black and ruined now. I wonder what it measures. So let's uh, try and get a measurement off it. Uh, let's zoom out so you can see the meter and things. There we go. Right, let's see what that actually reads. So it goes between that tag there and the capacitor. Oh, one ohms. Three hundred and forty ohms. Well, it does look a bit orange at one end. Could be three hundred and something, couldn't it? Hmm. We got our work cut out, haven't we? Right. Okay. Let's start. Um, I don't know where to start, really. Yeah. <laughs> I choose to start this sleeving. Whilst it looks, you know, that it's been soldered in there, it does look original, doesn't it? Because it's the same as the other sleeving. Then again, you don't know what's been done. You know, they might have taken a bit of sleeving up here and, and yeah. Mm. Right. I choose to start. Where am I going to start? I'm going to start with this little waxy over here. And what are you? Yuck. Sticky and vile is what you are. So that's 0.01 of a mic at 350 volts. 0.01. Right, we're going to want some high voltage capacitors. 0.01. Yep, 0.01. So that's 10 nanofarads. So if I just cut that off there, I can solder that in there and the world will be a better place. Right. I'm betting the one next to it's the same because obviously we've got two identical channels because it's a stereo amplifier. But uh, one at a time. Point oh five. 
Right, well, there we go. That's those nasty four wax capacitors evicted. Um, I think I really need to start tracing out what some of these things are. Uh, I'm going to eliminate that electrolytic in there next. And that's 16 mic at 450 volts. We might be pushing our luck here. I may have to order something in. Ooh, 16. I've got 22. And let's be honest, it's not like I've got a valve rectifier to take care of. So 22 microfarads over 16. Um, yeah, I don't think that's going to hurt me much. Let me just have a little look where the wiring goes. It is back off. There are two purple wires. I think it is in the cathode. Why would you have 450 volts in the cathode? That makes no sense. So, yeah. Two valves are coupled together there. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, in the event of not having 16 mic, or even a 10 I can put in there. 47, I've got a lot of 22 mics. Ah, oh, hang on. No. I've got a 10. I've got 4.7 to go with it. How many volts is it? 450. That's 10 at 350, 4.7 at 400. No. I'm going to go with 22, Mike. If it doesn't work, we'll come back and have another look at it. Okay, so here's a pinout of our ECL82. This is the EC bit, and that's our triode preamplifier. And here is our pentode um, power amplifier, anode beam forming plates, second grid, grid, and our cathode. And that is where our um, and that burned up resistor is. So I just googled for a simple ECL82 class A amplifier, and came to this look. And uh, here it is. That's our pentode side on this one. So we're coming down here, and there is our resistor. They reckon 330 ohms. Ours read 340 something. So yeah, it's pretty much okay, but I'm still going to change it anyway because that one's horribly scabby. Good, that's proved that out. Okay, so this was. Probably 330 ohms, probably still is, but I found this wonderful vintage looking RS branded one, look, 330 ohms, so we're going to substitute that in there because, well, it's a little bit better looking than that one. So let's just, uh, where am I going to snip him off? I'll snip him off there. And... There, I may take this tag out in a minute because that's our cathode bypass capacitor in there. And I, quite frankly, I don't want it in the can with our HT reservoirs. So I may snip that red wire. Have we got an unused tag anywhere? No, we haven't. That's a pity. Still, we shall overcome. Um, I think what I'm going to do is take that off and put an external bypass capacitor, what was it? 25 mic at 25 volts. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. So let's get this end attached first anyway. I don't want a blob of flux on here because this is horribly ancient. Just so I can get it to tin up. Am I on camera? No, I'm not. Widen that out. There we are. OK, 
Okay, so there's a dob of flux on there. Let's see if it's going to want to take solder. It does beautifully. So let's get that back into our tag over here and work out what I'm going to do at the other end. Just checking again to see if I've got a spare tag and I, and I haven't. Sometimes there's a spare tag you can sort of use to take something to. Hmm, what am I going to do? So let's get a 20, a 20 and 30 mic capacitor at 25 volts. Uh, what have I got? 22. Wouldn't hurt to have it a little bit larger, really. <laughs> you see, there's 33 mic in this day and age. And it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's tiny. So I've got to come across there somehow. And then go on to the green lead that's coming out of the valve base itself. I suppose I could just take it onto the valve base. Let's have a look, see where we can get. So if I snip this green wire off temporarily, so that is coming from our pin to cathode. If I solder that straight onto the valve, and then take the capacitor out from the valve over to the ground point over there, or any point in the chassis really. Oh, in fact, there's a ground point just on the centre of the valve there. So I could hover that in the middle of there. I think that's a great idea. So I'm just going to take that green wire out. That means I've only got to find two capacitors to stuff my can with. Right, that's that green wire evicted. I'm going to cut that so I can get it through the valve base. I'm quite honestly a bit surprised that there's only one cathode bypass. I mean that's uh, Slightly shoddy practice, I'd have thought. Still, as I said before, it was built to a price. And it probably wasn't very expensive. Mind you, stereo in 1958, I bet it commanded quite a price. So I need to go between that pin there and that pin there with my capacitor. Certain guitar amps, like the Fender, Fender Champ, didn't actually have uh, cathode bypass capacitors. It takes the gain down, but it gives them a little bit of, I don't know, colour a little bit, I suppose. So, but if you bypass the capacitor, it does improve, uh, bypass, the, bypass the cathode, it does uh, bring the gain up. So when we say bypass, all our audio is going down the capacitor whilst it still has DC flowing through the resistor. So the capacitor for DC, uh, sorry, the cathode under DC conditions is slightly above ground, but under AC conditions isn't. It's as near as to ground as we can get it using a capacitor. Okay, so that's good. We've just got our HT smoothing uh, to worry about now. And I'm happy cathode resistors often, often get a bit burnt, but look at the state of that. That is quite unpleasant. Right, jolly good, even if it was actually sort of still to spec. So I've now got to deal with my reservoir capacitor. So that's going to be an unstuffing job, I think. So we need to get these tags out of the way. This one's been soldered up, which is going to be... <laughs> I say it's been soldered up. Somebody made an attempt at soldering it up. <laughs> okay, straighten that tang up there. Straighten that tang up there. Okay, it's coming out. We've got a resistor attached here to ground. Well, sort of ground that was only just soldered if it was at all I don't believe it was I don't think that I'd ever taken since the factory 
I wonder if it's always had a crackling problem, I wonder. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so what do I need to do to get these leads off? I think I'm just going to snip through them and then solder the tags back on after. So it's yellow to the right, red to the left. Not it's going to make any difference whatsoever. One. And two. Okay, so we can wiggle the thing out. There it is. CCL. Goes that way in. Yeah, we've got this pretty much sussed to the two coloured wires to the red. Yeah, okay, let's pop that back over there and set about working out what to do with this. Do I restuff it or do I try and find two other capacitors that will do the job? Um, once again, 32 plus 32, I don't think I'm going to have. I've got two 47s. High enough voltage, 400 volts. Those are 350. Um, the reason I'm not so fussed about the capacitance here is because um, we haven't got a valve rectifier. If we had a valve rectifier, we'd be very careful on the input capacitance on the first capacitor for sure, um, because as the valve starts to heat up, starts to draw current, that capacitor starts to fill up with charge. If the capacitance is too large, it'll draw too much current through a partially warm valve, and it'll actually blow the cathode coating away and cause the valve either a short life or instant death. So, um, yeah, what am I going to do? Am I going to restuff or am I going to make um, just connect these up? Mm. Restuff or reconnect? It would be easier for me just to sort of reconnect them. Could cut the can, make a job of it that way. Or I could just lie them in there. Decisions, decisions. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I am going to lie them in. I can get a good mechanical connection on one leg to ground just there. They'll sit in there very nicely. Or will they? Have a decent electrical connection to ground, a decent mechanical connection to ground, and then I can make a loop up there. Yeah, it's not going to be the nicest, most pleasant solution, but it is, however, going to be a lot easier than me messing around with that capacitor, and I am running out of time. So, if you ever take this apart and see what I've done and you don't like it, I'm sorry. So that's uh, got the capacitors sat together like that with the grounds coupled. Let's uh, solder that in. Now let's do what Fidelity managed to fail to do all those years ago and get this to solder up because they made a noise out of that. Thankfully here we are asking all the power of my uh, Metcal soldering iron. Thankfully, it's got plenty. So this wishes to go to ground. I'm gonna, I'm gonna double that over to give it a bit of strength. Yep, and then that can sit in. 
just somehow like that. Yeah, but it's not ideal, but it's as snug as a bug in a rug. Right. That resistor there went to ground. Let's move these out of the way. That resistor there needs to come down to ground. Funnily enough, that's hot. We've got a red and an orange that go over to there. Now that's from this resistor here. And the orange is from the rectifier. So, sneak that one through over there, push that back down in there, that can come back over there like that, I sold onto there, and I will insulate that up a bit. Uh, wire strippers, well that could be an exciting game of finding something. I choose these ones. Hmm, okay, we're getting there. We are getting there. So we got HG capacitors done, all the waxies done. Okay. Right, these are 1.2 meg ohms down to ground. We need to just check all right, because they have a habit of going high resistance. So 1.2 mega ohms from that pin there to ground. 1.4, close enough for government work. And that one is open. I saw 1.4, didn't I? 1.4, close enough. Um, that's one, that's 120k there. Sorry. No, that's 120k. Has that gone very, very low? Unusual for something to go low. Let's check its mate over here. 2k, and they're both reading the same. Ah, oh, it's because they've got those 2k's across them there. Everything else looks pretty plumbing good. Two seventy k to eighty seven, close enough for government work. Close enough. A bit further out, isn't it? We got across there. Two k. I want that one as well, which goes over to there, I think. 2k. Yeah, we're in pretty good shape. Okay. Right. Um, I suppose we better hook some speakers up and see if it performs is the next thing. Um, and then we need to consider how I'm going to feed this with a modern cartridge. Ah. Got to deal with this bridge rectifier. I am going to, um, yeah, I'm going to Google that. So um, let's just go and see what it is. Okay, well, I've done a little bit of um, a little bit of research into our rectifier, and it is in fact a metal rectifier and not a selenium. So um, whilst it won't stink when it lets go. Um, I still don't think I want it involved. So I am in fact going to replace it with a silicon rectifier. Now that gives us a problem um, because a metal rectifier uh, is less efficient than a silicon one by quite a margin. So our HT rail is going to rise. So to combat that, we're going to put a resistor in series with our rectifier just to drop a few of those volts away. Um, so yeah, it, I want to end up with about 250 volts of HT on the anode of the valve. 
So um, yeah, we can we can measure that and then adjust the resistor in there to suit. So first things first, let's disconnect this old metal rectifier. And I'm, I'm tempted to just leave it in there, to be honest, and we'll pop our new rectifier in its place. In fact, I could use its original mounting screw. That might, uh, quite like that idea. Um, so the notch positive, uh, sorry, yeah, notch is positive. So let me just unscrew that. Let's get a better screwdriver for the job. And see if it's long enough just to accommodate the new rectifier. The new rectifier will be so understressed, you wouldn't believe it. Right, oh, it's plenty long enough, look. Will it fit through the hole? It will. Happy days. Okay. I'm not sure I like that. It's too close to the pins. Um, how am I going to remedy that? Space it out with a plastic washer, perhaps? Yeah, I'm not sure I like that idea. I could put it in the other way up. That gives us... Well, that's quite acceptable. Yep, didn't realise the pins were offset. That's much better. Okay. So... There we go. Now it's just a matter of wiring it back up. Right, our positive disappears down through the chassis. So I'm just going to hang on to that for a minute. Ah, uh, this is our negative lead. Uh, sorry, our AC input lead. Put our resistor in that other one, but it looks to me like this is the one where the where the winding has been compromised on the transformer. Um, don't know whether you can see that. I zoom in. Uh, you can see that exposed. No, you can't. It's gone all blurry. There you go. You can see that exposed conductor there. Not very happy about that at all. So I'm just going to try and um, work this wire out of there without damaging it and find out what's gone on. Why oh, it's got this gunge around it. Mm, nasty. Well back in place. Uh, this is where I want to put. Now I'm going to start off with 100 ohms because um, I had some left that the French radio hadn't blown up. Um, I'm just going to tack it in place to see what performance we get to start with. Um, if the HT isn't satisfactory I'll make adjustments. I think 100 ohms is going to be too high um, but we'll see how we get on. I don't really know what's coming in from the transformer, so working out whether that resistor is going to be all right or not is uh, moot at the minute. Right, now I've got an orange wire that's supplying our HT. So I think if that's it there, I'm going to replace it because it's massively too short now. That is it. mechanical joint there and hopefully that will allow me to pull the orange wire through and the red will follow suit. Where are we? There. Yep, off 
we go. We're coming through. Coming through. This spring, by the way, probably held a plate that held the valves into the chassis, stop them falling out. <coughs> but presumably uh, broke long ago. Right, that then can pull a little bit tighter than that. That'll do. And connects over to there. Okay. Right, well we should, believe it or not, be in sort of working order now. So, we'll just sort ourselves out a bit. Uh, that's one speaker, that's another speaker. So we ought to have both of those connected, really. Uh, we've got inputs over here. That's mains output to the turntable. I need to monitor my HT, which I can easily do on that capacitor there. And then uh, switch on. We are already switched on. So yeah, let me organise that and we'll come back. Okay, so what I've got, um, I've got my signal generator feeding in here. Um, it's currently outputting nothing, but uh, the meter here is across my anode connection, so I don't want this to get up above 250 volts, really. Uh, we are on the lamp limiter because, yep, uh, I've got that 100 ohms in at the moment, and it's uh, not very pleasant, but it's... It's in there. Let me just check we're not shorting against anything. No, it looks okay. Um, so, yeah, I shall plug the lamp limiter in to the variac. There's a plug for that one. There we are. And I shall slowly increase the voltage and we shall see what happens. Nothing at all. It's because that needs to be on. There we go. Right. Okay, we've got 52 volts on our rectifier already, and I'm only at 51 volts input. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, what's gone fizzle there then? Mm. Mains is out of the way here, isn't it? Yep. Is it 100 ohms again? There's still 70 volts on that. Let's just wait till that discharges. <laughs> yeah. Something objected. What have I done wrong? Ah. I'm just going to dim the light a little bit and I'm just going to put that back on. I wonder if it was just the bench creaking. It didn't sound like it. Uh, on. Well, it's definitely something is uh, not happy. Oh, I see what the problem is. Okay. That resistor is arcing across a cathode resistor. Okay. How's that happening, I wonder? Didn't look like anything was exposed there. Let's wait till that voltage just decays down a bit. We've still got 70 volts on there. Where's my discharging probe? Right, there was just the tiniest little arc occurring there. Why is that happening? That's our speaker output. Oh, I see why. Yep, yeah, okay, it all got a bit squashed. So, 
the HT was actually arcing against the uh, cathode there. Right, okay, that should have put pay to that. Uh, let's just try again, shall we? Uh, I need to know how many volts I've got on there, so... This is most interesting because now we've started to get stuff happening already. We're only at 128 volts. That resistor is going to be massively too small, isn't it? That really surprises me. Oh, start to hear an output. So we are working. Oh, now you see as the anode starts to draw more current as the valve warms up, our HT falls back off again. There we are. Oh, 300 volts is a bit rude, really. But it is working. That is good news. And that's the level I'm anticipating being able to drive this at 750 millivolts. So um, yeah, we've got a good level of output there. That's a little bit too high, I think. I am just going to go and look at the actual dissipation there. Let's just turn that off for a second. I'm going to just look on the end of our cathode resistor. See what the actual valve is seeing. If I can get on it. Straight onto the anode, which is going to be that one there. And actually look at the voltage across the valve would be a fairer test. Right, straight on. Okay, 350 volts. And then we'll have a look at the data sheet for an ECL. Whatever it is. Ah, you see? We actually measure the right voltage. We're somewhere near. 265 volts. I'd still like to see that a little bit less. Um, on the anode section. Yeah, it's recommended to be 200 volts. Let's try a bigger resistor in there. Right, well all my resistors seem to be 100 ohms <laughs> in that sort of range, so uh, I've got another one. And I'm just going to tack that again temporarily in series with the uh, power supply. One thing I have noticed is there was none of that hum we had when I initially switched it on. So that's good news. Right, well that's nasty, isn't it? Let's power up again and see what we get to. So I just want to measure my anode voltage there. Okay. Let's uh, slowly power it up again. Power is on. Currently we've got 360 volts, but of course the anode isn't conducting at all, so oh, there we go. How strange, it's hardly dropped it at all, has it? Perhaps we need a very large change of resistance. That's doubled it. We've barely dropped any voltage at all. OK. Switch off and we'll pick a bigger value of resistance. It's about 100, wouldn't it? 200. Should we say 500? Dare I say it? Right, what have we got? 
OK, 470 ohms. Going straight on. And things start to conduct. Two hundred and twenty-six. I think I'm calling it there. So well, that should give our valves a, a good long life as well. I wonder how overdrift the originals were just to get a few more watts out of it. But uh, no, they seem happy there. So next thing I'm going to do is just disconnect the power. And check how hot that resistor is going to do. Going to be. I could do the calculations, but I'm just going to put my finger on it. So uh, it looks large enough to me, but that is just an educated guess. So uh, let's just kill the power. And there. It's barely warm. There is some heat in it, but no, that's absolutely fine. If we uh, mount that carefully out of the way of stuff that's ever going to get bothered by a bit of heat. Um, that'll be absolutely fine. So that is the original electronics somewhere near done. Now we need to consider how we're going to fit a different cartridge. And um, yeah, that's going to be a job for next time here on Dozzy's Television Workshop. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode of me uh, yeah, getting some things wrong, a little bit of arcing down there, nothing that uh, some judicious movement of components. If you've enjoyed this anyway, click like, subscribe, do all that rubbish, and I'll see you very soon here on Doz's Television Workshop. Cheers now. Bye.
record player uh, for my dad. Right, um, yeah, last week we did the turntable. If you didn't see, let's do this again because I paused made a noise of it. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Dossie's Television Workshop. Shuffled in my shit, sheet, sheet. sheet.